another way of looking at this is that you know better than anyone how fragile life is, how precious and fleeting it is. You know that it could be gone in an instant. And that's scary, but it's also something that can be very clarifying. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 298. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And today I have a question and answer episode, as has been the case most weeks lately. I don't know. We'll see. I might have my wife on the podcast again soon for an interview or do something more long form in terms of like a deep dive episode. Uh, If you'd like to see that, let me know or listen to that rather. (laughs) Let me know. Um, I am doing, uh, two really good questions today. I've been really appreciating the variety of questions that I've gotten, and these two are, are good ones. I'm excited to get into them. Uh, if you want to send me a question for the show, please do so by emailing me, duffthepsych at gmail.com, or go to my website, duffthepsych.com and use the contact form there. Uh, either one of those work just fine. They go to the same place. And, uh, you know, I've said it before, but it's just, you know, unrealistic for me to individually respond to each email. Um, but know that I get them and know that I am looking at all of them and, you know, kind of picking and choosing for each episode individually. And if you want to know if your episode or if your uh, question has been featured on an episode, you just got to listen, or you can go to the website and search for something that, you know, uh, sounds similar to the question you've asked to see if you missed it or something like that. Um, but yeah, I hope that you guys are treating yourselves really well. I hope that you've had a good week. Uh, my week's been actually really quite good. I'm, you know, I had to kind of forcefully reintegrate to the real world after going on a, a quick little spontaneous vacation with my wife. And uh, actually went from that into her having a surgery and recovering from that, which was just like, bang, 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 good stuff. But the surgery was fine. It was good. It was an elective procedure, something she wanted. So, you know, don't worry about that. But um, yeah, so it was just a lot of stuff. But it kind of kicked my ass into gear to sort of catch up on work and, you know, get things situated around the house. And and sometimes I'm the type of person that when I have more going on, I do better at doing more. It's kind of a snowball effect. Of course, there's a limit to that where you start to burn out and uh, not do so well. But um, I found a pretty good sweet spot this weekend. So I'm, I'm happy going into the weekend here. And uh, yeah, mostly good stuff going on. So I hope that that's the case for you as well. If not, you know. There's tomorrow, there's the next day. You can get back on whatever horse it is you need to get back on or get whatever help or resources you need to to start working that way. But without further ado, why don't we go ahead and just get into the questions? Here's the first one. Okay, so first question reads, how does one manage and prevent emotional burnout as a therapist? I want to apply to clinical psychology programs because I believe this would be such a great profession for me and my interests. My only hesitation is that I'm a sensitive person and I'm worried that the weight of people's problems could make this job hard to enjoy and last in long term. Thank you. Um, Yeah, it's a really good question. For those of you who may not be fully aware, clinical psychology is like the degree that I have. So I have a a PhD in clinical counseling and school psychology um, with a focus in clinical, but ostensibly it's basically just a clinical psychology degree. The other ones are sort of... um, uh, you know, more in name than in actual training. So yeah, um, I am pretty well equipped to answer this question. I think um, it's a really good one. I've talked about different types of burnout before, but this one is obviously so close to home that I just wanted to make sure I took this one as well, specifically about going into into psychology. Um, because you know, I do see a lot of people in my field of work, um, whether that's at the at the doctoral level or at the master's level. You know, in the mental health field broadly. I see a lot of people work themselves to a point of burnout 
And it can absolutely be a tough job if you're not paying attention to this kind of thing. You can wind up in really bad shape down the line. So I'm really glad to hear that you're considering this right up front, even before diving into the degree. Um, so good job with that. The answer for this is going to be, you know, different from person to person, but I do think that it needs to be considered. Um, just at a baseline level, I think that everyone has a different tolerance for absorbing emotions from other people. And, you know, some people are, are very, very empathetic while still having a good kind of container around their own heart where it doesn't necessarily impact them so much. Um, I kind of come and go with that. There are times where I'm really good at that. There are times where I'm, uh, my, you know, my barrier is like a little bit looser, but I think in general, I probably am naturally a little bit more um, able to do that than a lot of people that I know. Um, but, you know, everybody's tolerance is different. And so it's under, it's important to have some self-awareness and understand your baseline, understand what you're coming in with. The fact that you're a sensitive person is not inherently a bad thing, not at all. Um, it, it does present, you know, the challenge of you needing to be more careful with your emotional state. But I think that you also probably have some unique advantages. Um, being somebody who is sensitive, you probably are more empathetic and understanding. And you may have the ability to level with your future clients in a way that other people who are, you know, less sensitive may not be able to do. And those are great things. Those are, you know, good reasons to get into the field even. You know, sometimes you get into the field because it's just natural and it's what you fall into. Sometimes you do because you've had your own experiences and that kind of inspired you. And in some cases, you're just really good at something and it's sort of like you need to rise to that occasion because, you know, the field needs you. So there's a good chance that that might apply to you, that there's a good reason for you to be out there helping as long as you could do it in a safe and sustainable way. Um, so yeah, you know, that's, that's possibly the case, but it is also the case that, you know, you are more at risk of taking on too much emotional burden from others in a way that's not sustainable or healthy. So here are some things you can consider. Um, one is that you get to choose the type of work that you want to do. I think that a lot of people come into the mental health field thinking that they have to be able to help every single person that walks through the door, no matter what, anybody that seeks help, they should be able to help them. That's admirable, but we also are not medical doctors, right? So we don't have the same sort of oath that means we need to help anybody that walks through the door. We don't need to help everybody that needs it. We can be more selective about the types of work that we do. And in certain ways, being more selective, having a focus, those things can actually help you um, better work with the people that you do work with, right? Because you're not spread thin, you're able to kind of have more of a specific niche, you're able to um, not put yourself in positions that you would not be able to do as good of work, right? So you can actually do more good than harm by being more selective. Now, of course, there are more problematic ways of being more selective, um, but it is just a different field than, than actual medicine for that reason. So, you know, as an example, somebody who has maybe a personal history of trauma may not feel that they're able to or want to do trauma work with people, and that's valid. For others, uh, they might have a hard line in working with people that have committed violence, uh, especially toward children. For others, maybe they have a preference for, you know, a certain age group or certain types of demographics. Maybe they are specialized in working with people who, you know, look or are like them in a certain way. And all of these things are okay. Um, now, during your education, so during your training, you're probably going to have less precise control over exactly what kind of cases you see, the types of training that you do receive in school. That's, you know, um, you, you might have more influence than you think. I often encourage people, you know, in training programs to really speak up about what they would like to get out of it, because often things are sort of moldable and changeable. Um, but if you don't rock the boat at all, you'll never find that out. Um, but in general, you know, you're going to be somewhat at the mercy of the training program and, you know, what they're uh, regimen is, what types of people you see, what types of training you get. And that's just sort of par for the course. But once you're out there in the real world, uh, you get to choose where you work and who you work with to an extent. Uh, if you fall into a work setting where maybe you're at like a busy healthcare center or something like that, you may have less control, right? Like when I worked at a healthcare center in my internship, I did have to see, you know, whoever they put on my schedule as an intake. But again, you know, the, the choice kind of comes at the top level. You can choose where you would like to work. You don't have to work at a place like that if you don't want to. 
Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by Ana Luisa Jewelry. So I can't believe that time is going so quickly that uh, Mother's Day is actually coming up here. So you might be starting to look for a nice gift for a special caretaker in your life, or maybe you're just awesome and like to give those you care about, including yourself, uh, pretty things that don't break the bank. So this week, I'm excited to tell you about Ana Luisa Jewelry. And that's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A, Ana Luisa. They make really nice, beautiful gold jewelry, including chains, statement necklaces, earrings, and rings. Uh, they have a ton of different options at price points starting as low as $39, but uh, don't let that low price give you pause. Their stuff is really good quality. Um, I was lucky enough to pick out a few things to give to my wife, and she's been wearing them constantly. In particular, she's been wearing this uh, summer heart necklace set that has a, it's a stack, so it has a plain gold chain, and then a lighter chain with a cute little heart charm on it. Not too big, but um, you know, big enough that you can definitely see it from a distance, and she's been wearing it like crazy. Um, I also got her the uh, Estrella or Estrella earrings, and they're just like these dainty, cute little star earrings, which would be a really good gift for somebody who has like a delicate style in your life. Um, and she's already worn these in a bunch of different outings. And the last thing that I got her were these uh, snake earrings. Uh, again, kind of small, dainty, but these little gold snakes, which are which are pretty cool and badass. Um, you can see these pieces all over her Instagram. So if you look up at joelle.in.daylight, that's her Instagram. Uh, you can see these pieces all over because she's been wearing them very frequently. Um, but a couple other cool points about the company, they pride themselves on being both carbon neutral and water neutral. And that goes from their packaging to their manufacturing process. And they release new jewelry collections every Friday. So there's always something new to see. So go to shop.analuisa.com slash duff. And again, Anna Luisa is A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A. And uh, make Mother's Day a treat uh, with new jewelry pieces from Anna Luisa. They have a buy one, get one 40% off sale right now. So you can get one piece for her, one piece for you or somebody else in your life. So shop.analuisa.com slash duff. All right, back to the show. In training programs, so in in clinical psychology programs, it is often encouraged and uh, sometimes even required uh, to have your you know therapist in training also go to therapy. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, one is that you can become more familiar with what it's like to be a client in therapy. What it's more, what it's like to be kind of on the other side of the room. Um, and also because receiving your own support is crucial at times during, you know, the time when you're doing clinical work, just to keep yourself afloat, to give you a place to process and help you with your own mental health. So um, it's, it's very often encouraged that you do that. Um, and as you're going through your training program, as you're venturing out there into the field, potentially as a clinician, it could be important for you to make sure that you continue that, that you have your own therapist to get you through difficult emotions that you're left with. And just to process things be like, man, you know, I, you know, this case really threw me for a loop. You're not getting supervision necessarily. They're not going to like help you with the case, but somebody that gets it, somebody that understands what it's like and can empathize with you and maybe point out some, some blind spots that you're having about something or ways that you are over interpreting things that can all be extremely helpful. One interesting thing about emotional burnout is that it can sometimes be a bit hard to catch. And it's funny because, you know, as mental health professionals, we can be really good at spotting stuff in other people. But when it comes to ourselves, that's not always the case. So therefore, you may need to specifically work on that. You know, through things like therapy, journaling, self-reflection of whatever type, you can start to notice your own behavior patterns, things that indicate that you are starting to get burned out or depressed, things of that sort. So for me, personal examples, um, things that I've learned that I need to watch out for are when I'm getting more frequent headaches. So if I wake up with headaches often or I'm going to sleep with headaches, that's a, that's a pretty common one. Um, if I'm being less patient with my family, you know, maybe more snippy with the kids or with my wife, um, when I'm having kind of random feelings of loneliness and kind of little bursts of emotion like that I that aren't explained by you know, what's immediately happening in the day. So it's not like I had a bad day in particular. It's not like um, I got in a fight with my wife or the kids were really acting up or I saw something bad on TV, but I just feel like empty, lonely, emotional, things like that, uh, especially at night. Those things are um, indicators to me that I've consistently seen pop up over the years that tell me, okay, you're starting to approach burnout here. Something's going on. You need to pay more attention to these things. 
So for you, you will find a, a different set of things, but you can start to notice what are those behavior patterns that indicate, okay, I'm moving toward burnout here. I need to make some adjustments. Another great source of information like this is other people in your life that you can trust. So if you have a family or a partner or good friends that are willing to um, be honest with you and let you know when they notice your behavior changing, that can be a really great thing. So for me, often, you know, that's my wife. It could also be um, some of my close friends that, that, you know, watch over me more closely. Um, but, you know, if my wife is like, hey, are you doing okay? You know, if I say I'm getting snippy with her or like I'm irritated in general, something like that, she might be like, hey, are you okay? It seems like things are getting to you more right now than usual. And that would be like, oh, yeah, maybe you're right. Or sometimes you might ask, like, are you running out of steam? Like, are you are you getting there? You know, just sort of acknowledgement that uh, something seems a bit off and it's not necessarily clear where that's coming from. That can give me just a little nudge that I need to self-reflect and look at how I'm actually doing. So think about those people as well, you know, in your life, or, you know, you don't even have to have them right now because this is hypothetical in the future as you're going through a program and, and you know, starting your job. Um, but there will be people in your life that hopefully you are able to sort of trust and lean on in this way. Not rely on them entirely, but, you know, if you have people that are willing to call you on it, all the better. So, you know, these are signs. These are things that you can keep an eye on and things that will tell you it's time to adjust to make some changes before things get out of hand. And in terms of what change you make, that could mean taking some vacation time if you have that in your place of work. It could mean reducing your caseload. You know, if you're in private practice, maybe there's something that you can do to take on less cases or see those cases less frequently. Uh, increasing your focus on your own coping skills, you know, um, doubling down on therapy or, you know, just taking a, a particular focus on what you can do to cope with whatever, you know, stress, depression, anxiety symptoms you're experiencing. Um, or, you know, maybe taking a really hard look at your work, at your job, and determining whether there are some real structural changes that need to be made, uh, even thinking about potentially a different job if it comes down to that. You don't have to rush to that sort of thing, but ask yourself these questions, see what you can do to adapt or change so that you don't get into that bad place. Now, another thing that does tend to happen when you are a mental health professional is that you naturally sort of fall into a pattern of being a support for others. And this isn't always like overt. It's not somebody always uh, just using you for your emotional labor in a very clear way. It can sort of be more the case that people know that you're a great friend, that you're a good talker um, or a good, not good talker. You might be, but like somebody who's good to talk to, I guess. Um, and they know that they can talk to you about more difficult topics because you don't flinch away from them and you provide good insights. So, you know, not thinking otherwise, they might just launch into those topics unexpectedly. Now, unfortunately, since these other people are not mental health professionals, they may not be the best at checking in about whether you're in a good place to hear these things that they want to talk about. You very well could not be, or it could just be one more thing, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. And this is where boundaries come in. Um, you may need to be more forward about establishing boundaries with people. You don't have to necessarily preemptively know what all your boundaries are going to be in this regard. Sometimes you have to kind of stumble upon them first, but... It's a process of learning, you know, learning yourself, paying attention and adjusting as necessary, as we've said. So with friends, you might have some conversations, family members as well. You might have some conversations like, hey, you know, I don't want you to feel bad at all. You didn't do anything wrong. You did not know. But um, at work, because of what I do, I tend to absorb a lot of pain from other people. And in the future, I would appreciate it if you could just check in first before getting into heavy topics. Um, you know, I don't want you to be nervous about it. I'll be straight with you. I will be honest with you if I don't have space for it, but it would make a, a big difference to me if you would just check in. I do care about you and I want to hear about these things, but sometimes there's, there are better times than others. So just give me a quick check in and I'll let you know if that's going to be okay. You know, the next time it comes up, you know, something like that, that, that could go very far. And, uh, you know, if, if people don't take that very well, you need to consider whether that's the type of person that you need to be spending a lot of time with, right? That, that That's a total reasonable thing for you to be asking for. It's also a great thing for you to be doing. If, if you're listening, you know, if you are a friend that sometimes relies on other friends for support, always asking if they have space for it, if, they, if they're cool with you talking about a topic, um, you know, just in a way kind of getting consent for it is a good thing to do. Another thing um, that I do to avoid burnout 
it kind of has more to do with just how I've structured my career in general. So one of the reasons that I knew I wanted to get a PhD rather than operating at the master's level. So at the master's level, we're talking about things like an MFT or LCSW. There's a bunch of master's level degrees that would allow you to get licensed and do clinical work as a therapist, um, among other things. Um, but a lot of master's level people are you know, in the field doing the direct clinical work. And rather than be kind of held to just that, I wanted to make sure I could have more flexibility and options, which is why I got the doctorate. So with that, I can teach, I can write, I can perform research, I can do assessments, I can be a therapist if I want, I can, you know, consult at the organizational level. There's a bunch of different things that you can do because, you know, basically anything that falls under that umbrella will be fair game. So for me in particular, it's important to have variety. Um, I think that I would have a bit of a hard time if I was just doing full-time therapy every day. There are some people that are built for that, and there are some therapists that crank out like seven sessions every day of the week, and that would be difficult for me to do personally without burning out. So, you know, my weeks are fairly balanced. I see a nice handful of therapy clients, you know, basically a few, most days of the week, except for one day of the week, um, I see a few therapy clients. The most I ever see in a day is like probably five, but usually it's more like, you know, three, four, sometimes two. And so I have those. Um, I have three neuropsychological assessments that I do each week. So I do, you know, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I do neuropsych cases. Those are at my, you know, real office. Those take a longer amount of time. So it's kind of more, you know, that full half day. Um, and then I have open spaces in my schedule that are intentionally there. So I can do report writing for the assessments that I've done. So I could work on this show and my outlines for the podcast. And so that I can work on other projects. And then, you know, obviously there's also parenting relationships, stuff like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I try to make sure I have a, a, a balance and variety. Otherwise, you know, too much of one thing for me definitely puts me more at risk of, of that burnout. Uh, but this might not be the case for you. Maybe you're a creature of habit and you find a lot of comfort in basically the same exact thing every day. That's okay. But you can think about these things. You know, if you have this self-awareness to understand yourself, you can apply that throughout the entire process and work to construct a career that works well for you. Um, the last thing I'll say is just to make sure you have a life outside of work. Um, this might be a bit obvious, right? But I see so many people in the mental health field not really applying this advice to themselves. Not only does having interests and activities outside of work help you to just replenish your energy and your kind of internal reserve to keep you relatively sane, but it actually helps in therapy. You know, I, I, I think a lot of people have had this experience where the best teachers or professors are ones with real lived experience. You know, they don't just exist fully inside a classroom. I think clients respond in much the same way that if their therapist is a, a real person, they know that their therapist does things other than therapy. Um, you know, they feel more inclined to trust them. Uh, the knowledge that you learn in your training program needs to be grounded in reality. And if you're not getting out there in the world in some capacity and experiencing things, where are you going to get that grounding from? So those are my thoughts. Hopefully these thoughts have been helpful to you. I think it's great that you're considering your own health and your well-being as you move toward this possible career. Um, I think it's totally possible for you as an individual to have a really great career in this field and keep a good balance. Just going to take a little bit of thinking. So thank you for that. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by Audible. You guys already know Audible is one of my favorite apps and favorite uh, sponsors for the show because I use them constantly. <laughs> Audible lets you enjoy all of your audio entertainment in one app. You know that they have thousands of different audiobooks. They also offer incredible selections in their Audible originals. So these are things only made for Audible from top celebrities, experts, and new voices in audio as well. And newly, Audible also includes thousands of podcasts from popular favorites to new series as well. As an Audible member, you can choose one title each month to keep from the entire catalog, no matter how long or short that is. And members also get full access to a growing selection of included audiobooks Audible Originals, and podcasts, and you can download or stream all of those that you want whenever, regardless of whether you have any credits or not. 
I love Audible, as I said. Uh, right now, I am currently listening to two different books, uh, two very different books. One is a re-listen of one of my favorite books uh, ever. It's a fantasy book called The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. And it's a part of a, a two-book series currently. There's supposed to be a third one at some point. Hopefully, we get that eventually. Um, but it has one of the best prologues that I've ever read. And it's just a really good fantasy book with a really fleshed out universe, including its own lore, its own fairy tales, all of that. It's it's wonderful. Um, the other one that I'm reading is a little bit, uh, well, I said a lot different. It's called The Loving Dominant. So it's about, you know, BDSM um, and, you know, in particular, um, you know, being a dominant. And, uh, you know, the approach with that is how to approach it with care, with safety, um, consent, things of that sort. And so if that's an interest of yours, whether you are, you know, top or bottom, that might be something that you would be interested in listening to as well. So yeah, Audible makes it easy to listen to these or any books that you would like anytime, anywhere. And new members can try Audible for free for 30 days. So if you want to check out Audible, head over to audible.com slash Duff, or you can text Duff, D-U-F-F, to 500 Either one will work, audible.com slash Duff, or text Duff to 500 and you can get those 30 days for free. All right, back to the show. All right, so on to question two. It reads, I have found comfort in your podcast and appreciate you shedding light on a wide variety of topics. I was hoping maybe you can cover this on your next episode. I'm a 25-year-old woman, and I struggle with coping with grief. Everyone in my family has passed by the time I was 24, and I recently just got to say goodbye, or just had to say goodbye to my other half, my dog, February of 2022. I've lost someone every year since 2015 and I have a hard time focusing on getting through to better days, and often find myself just rushing through the days, almost rushing to when it's my time, and hope to see them again one day. I do not have thoughts of self-harm, but I can't help but miss them, and wishing I could turn back time. Also, I feel guilty for wanting to return back to normal. Air quotes there. Thank you again for all that you do. (sighs) Well, man, uh, I'm so sorry to hear about this. That's a lot. That's way too much. Um, I'm glad that you're still here. You know, you said that you don't have thoughts of harming yourself, which is great. I wouldn't blame you even if you did. You know, that's just so much. That's too much for somebody to have to deal with. And I wish more than anything in this moment that I could just wrap you up in a big hug. Just give you a big, huge bear hug because, damn, that that, that really is terrible. Um, I imagine at this point, it's probably hard for you to feel safe. You know, a lot of people would be hyper alert and on guard because it always feels like the other shoe is about to drop. Like what more, what else, what's, what's going to be this year, right? As if this is your lot in life. And it would be totally reasonable for you to be having some pretty significant grief as well as maybe even depressive symptoms on top of all of this. Um, For one reason or another, I find that a lot of people don't consider medication in a situation like this. Um, antidepressant medication can absolutely be used to help you get through a difficult period of time, whether that's, you know, grief from losing people, whether that's, uh, you know, losing a job and having a really hard time in your life because of that, whatever the situation is, uh, medication can be used for that. Even if you as a person may not struggle with, you know, recurrent major depressive disorder or something like that, where it's a lifelong issue, you can still use that. The medication can give you that sort of chemical boost that you might need to be able to find enjoyment in everyday activities, Um, maybe some of the motivation that you need to remain engaged and, you know, do what you need to do while your world feels really bleak. You don't necessarily have to remain on them forever in the long run. It could just be to get you through this period until things start to normalize a little bit. Just something to think about. You know, if you're not taking something already, it's just something to think about. It's one coping option among many others. Um, and potentially in addition to others. When you say that you're rushing through your days, you know, toward the time that you might see them again, that makes me wonder how much of your thoughts and your feelings about these losses that you might be avoiding. You know, how much of the, the processing here have you potentially kind of worked your way around and instead just kind of put the blinders on and move forward, hoping that time passes? Even if there's nothing that you can do to bring them back, there may be some significant feelings that are still worth processing here. I think that each loss has its own set of unique feelings. And in some cases, maybe you feel guilty for surviving. In others, maybe you're angry with the person or with the world or with the circumstances 
There are any number of emotions that you might hold in response to these losses, and they're all okay to have. You don't get to control how you feel, but I would advise you whenever possible to approach them rather than avoid them. It sounds like the pattern of loss that you've experienced is making you feel disconnected from life. You know, like you're just marching on, letting time pass, and that things are a little pointless. Another way of looking at this is that you know better than anyone how fragile life is, how precious and fleeting it is. You know that it could be gone in an instant. And that's scary, but it's also something that can be very clarifying. With time and work, you may be able to find a new appreciation for life. If you haven't listened to it, I would really suggest that you check out the interview that I did a while back with uh, Kate Manser. Um, it's on episode 141 of the podcast. So duffthepsych.com slash episode 141. It very well may not be on, on like the popular podcast players right now, but if you go to the website, you can, you can stream it from there or click on the links there. Episode 141, I interviewed Kate Manser and uh, she wrote the uh, book, You Might Die Tomorrow. And, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff that she's done um, with that. But basically she experienced a long string of losses as well and came to realize that, you know, remembering your own mortality and the mortality of others can lead to fear, but it can also lead to an increased just zest and zeal for life that can actually help you to overcome things like decision paralysis. When you check your gut and you think about, you know, what would I think about this on my deathbed? That can really put things into a more clear perspective. Perhaps some of the emptiness or the weariness that you're feeling has to do with the fact that it's, you know, hard to care about the small things when you're so frequently confronted with how imp- unimportant these things are in the grand scheme of things when life is so fleeting. It's like, why bother about all of this when it could just be ripped out from underneath you at any moment? And I would say that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, maybe it is, though, a prompt for you to take a look at your life and see if there's anything that requires changing or adjusting. You know, are you living in line with your values? If not, what could you do about that? How could you be pursuing a life that's more in line with those values, getting closer to those? Because you're correct if that's how you feel, that there's a lot of stuff that's just not important in the end. So maybe thinking about what is important to you and whether your life is aligned with those things could be a good step here. Um, You had also mentioned that you want to return to feeling normal, but feel bad about that. I think that's a totally normal struggle to have, um, to have some guilt about wanting to return to a familiar life. But the thing is, you're allowed to want normality again. You're not the one that's gone. You know, you haven't died, but you have gone through a lot as well in these past few years. And I have to imagine that everything you do takes more effort um, and you've had to put so much effort out there to get through due to this severe disruption in your life. You might even feel guilty just thinking about that. Like, well, it's not about me. It's about these other people, but it is, you know, it is about you too. You have had to go through this and that doesn't take anything away from the other people that you've lost to consider yourself as well. You've been struggling too, and you just like things to be easier again. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, you did make reference to saying that, or you made reference to seeing those that you've lost again. So that makes me feel maybe you have some belief in an afterlife, which in this case, maybe could be a good thing. You know, that's not my personal belief, but, um, if that's the way that you feel and that's what you believe, that could be a good thing here. Um, because if that's the case, you might think about meeting them again on the other side. And, um, I assume that these people that you've lost, would want you to live. They'd want to know, you know, what your life was like while you, while they've been gone. And you need to think about what story you would want to tell them, right? When they say, oh, it's good to see you again. You're here finally. What has life been like? What have you been doing with yourself? What story do you want to tell them? I believe they'd want to know that you allowed yourself to enjoy life, you know, and that you found meaning in the experience of being alive, that you didn't take it for granted, that you didn't waste it because you know, they showed you how fleeting it could be. In some ways, living a good life and allowing yourself to explore the beautiful aspects of life can be a really good way of honoring them in every moment. And they don't have the opportunity to anymore, but you are still here. So those are just a few things to think about. You know, there's nothing that's going to solve this for you. You know, I can't bring those people back or your dog back. I wish that I could, but that's not how life works, you know? Um, And it's also really important to think about the fact that 
Just because you've had a string of losses, that doesn't mean that the string's necessarily going to continue. You know, these are independent things. And it's easy to fall into the fallacy of thinking that things are just going to continue to stay consistent. But there's nothing that says that has to be the case. But either way, you can kind of think about these things I've been talking about. Take these lessons that you've learned from these losses and apply them to your life in a way that honors the people that you care about that are no longer here. So thank you so much for the vulnerable question. And again, I'm so sorry you've had to experience all of this. It's a lot. And the fact that you're still forging onward, it tells me that you're a very strong person and you're doing a good job. So thank you for the question. And with that, guys, that is the end of the episode, ending on a bit of a, a bit of a heavy note here, but really good stuff. Um, thank you for those questions. This has been episode 298 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. Um, if you want to find the show notes, go to deaththepsych.com slash episode 298. And as always, if you want to send me a question, send it to deaththepsych at gmail.com. All right, take good care of yourselves, and I will see you for the next episode. Bye.